this presentation is being given by Shashwat Patal, CEO and founder of Megamart, as well as Ravi Jelani, who is TOC world-renowned expert. The title of the presentation is Unleashing Retail Success, Harnessing TOC Principles for Supermarket Growth. Unfortunately, Shashwat is unable, unable to join us for the TOC Innovation Summit, but he is here today willing to share his story with our community, so we thank him greatly. You will hear the remarkable transformation of Megamart, which is Nepal's leading supermarket chain. In, in a nation where supermarkets are a novel concept, Megamarket's adoption of the theory of constraints pr principles guided by Ravi Johani has propelled them for, from a challenging financial position to phenomenal success in just six months. Discover how Megamark strengthened their vendor partnerships and sharpened their focus on throughput and operations, resulting in a 33% increase in throughput, a 28% boost in sales, and an astonishing 200% rise in profit compared to the previous year. So get ready, do not miss this inspiring story of TOC's impact on retail. Whether you're an industry expert or simply seeking additional insights for your own adventures. Just for some background, Shashwat Dekal, he is a lifelong entrepreneur. Shashwat is the founder and CEO of Megamart, which operates the big mart chain of supermarkets and is based in Nepal, India. In the last 12 years, Megamart has grown to 78 stores and serves a million customers annually. Shashwat has an MBA from the National University of Singapore. He's joined today with TOC world-renowned expert Ravi Galani with over 51 years of industry experience. Ravi is a pioneer in eliminating cash constraints. Since 1998, Ravi has been introducing the theory of constraints to various companies, earning him the prestigious TOC ICO Lifetime Achievement Award. Ravi's influence has extended across a wide array of industries, from engineering to automotive and aerospace. He's credited with creating groundbreaking concepts like cash velocity and free cash score. He's transforming companies through his weekly review process. As a keynote speaker and workshop facilitator at Global Forum, Robbie shares his insights with a focus on making organizations debt-free and contributing to a five trillion economy. This webinar is approximately two hours, uh, including the presentation followed by live Q&A and discussion. You're welcome to share your uh, questions in the dashboard of GoToWebinar. Today's webinar, we're so thankful to Christoph Lenhart, who is joining us. He is a board member for TOCICO. So without further delay, I'm going to turn this off to Shashwat, Ravi, and Christoph. Thank you. Thank you for, the, for that introduction, Jennifer and, and Christiana. And um, also on behalf of the board of TOCICO, thanks again to Shashwat and to Ravi for being with us here today and for, for sharing your experience. Um, yeah, so Shashwat and, and Ravi, the floor is yours. Um, just for the audience, if you have a question, um, we have agreed that we will handle the questions during the, the presentation um, at appropriate places. So please enter your questions in the question box of the GoToWebinar, and um, then I will uh, read them to the uh, presenters at the appropriate point, and then we can have a little discussion around your questions. So don't be shy, feel free to ask your questions. That's all, always also one of the best ways to learn. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you everyone for the wonderful introduction. Uh, is my presentation visible to everyone? The is presentation is visible and we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, Ravi, sir, would you like to go first or do you want me to take it from Go ahead. You? I'll chip in as and when Thanks. it's required. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, again. Uh, welcome to all the guests uh, that are attending this. Uh, it's a great privilege and honor to share uh, 
what we do in our part of the world here in Nepal. Uh, hopefully, you know, we'll add a little bit of a uh, little bit of knowledge and uh, learning to the entire TOC ICO community. So without further ado, let me just get into the presentation right away. Uh, as uh, introduced by everyone, I am the founder CEO for uh, Mega Mart, which runs a chain of supermarkets here in Nepal, which is called Big Mart. So today what we'd be uh, talking about is uh, how TOC principles uh, have helped us as a company in our journey up to date and uh, how it has also helped us transform dramatically in the last six to eight months uh, with uh, the help of uh, uh, Mr. Ravi Gilani. Uh, <clears throat> just give a brief about the company and uh, our entire operating environment uh, here in Nepal for, for people who are not, uh, let's say, familiar with the country Nepal. Uh, so we run a chain of supermarkets that you find in markets. Uh, these are nice supermarkets in the developed economies. These are more smaller uh, supermarkets that uh, you know serve the daily needs of customers. And, uh, you know, we want to be a neighborhood supermarket. So we want to be close to our customers as much as we can and provide a great, uh, convenient and nice shopping experience to people so they can come to us uh, for all their needs, all their daily needs, and uh, as frequently as, as possible. So basically, the model is about uh, being able to provide, let's say, you know, 85% of the assortment that a big box store would, you know, store would carry. Uh, but do it uh, much more efficiently in a small store and close to your home, close to your neighborhood. Shashwat, we cannot hear you right now. Of the country Nepal. And, uh, uh, Shashwat, we, we lost a little bit of your uh, audio. It, it seems to, it may be an issue with your bandwidth. Maybe you can just uh, shut down your camera so that at least we can hear you without uh, interruption. Okay. <clears throat> Does that make it better? At least for the moment, yes. At least for the moment. We'll, we'll give it a try again. Yes. Uh, so we're mostly present uh, in Kathmandu Valley. As with supermarkets uh, all around the world, I guess, uh, it's an industry defined by low margins. Uh, uh, you know, in our part of the world, you know, the market is on the one hand dominated by these small mom and pop stores that spring up everywhere around the corner. For a lot of you, if you've visited, uh, you know, this part of the world or let's say the more lesser developed part of the world, you will have noticed that there's a lot of mom and pop stores around. Or there are, you know, there is a very big box departmental store around. So we try to position our store chain somewhere in the middle. Uh, so try to give an experience that a box store would give, but, uh, you know, be able to provide the services that a small mom and pop store would do. Obviously, Nepal being, you know, one of the lesser developed economies in the world, we struggle with obviously low per capita income here. So, you know, it's generally agreed throughout the world, probably that, you know, until a country hits a certain per capita income base, uh, the market is not quite ready for a supermarket chain. We're obviously trying to change that. Uh, we've succeeded a little bit in that up to now, but we've got a long way to prove that. Uh, you know, considering that Nepal is also a landlocked economy and we don't have a lot of manufacturing capacity, uh, a lot of our supplier base consists of uh, importers uh, and, uh, you know, 70% of products imported into a country. So the supplies are very unreliable and, uh, you know, it could be, uh, it can get really, really uh, sketchy uh, to maintain a very high level of uh, availability at the shelf or the, at the store level, uh, you know, because the nature of the economy is so. That's about what we do briefly and what 
our operating environment if you get a sense of what you know what we are what we are facing here <clears throat> so some very fundamental principles that we tried to follow uh, you know to varying degrees but you know at a very basic level we try to follow this uh, as much as we can which is we like to keep complexity levels low by working with you know limited uh, assortment ranges so for someone who is not in the retail i probably need to explain what assortment would be so assortment is just you know the range of products that you carry in your shelves so we try to keep it as low as possible but not very low uh, because we also want you know would want to be differentiating ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the local mom and pop stores the second uh, basic principle that we like to follow is uh, we like to hold most of our inventory centrally and keep our store inventory as low as possible as low as possible i say uh, sometimes there are display considerations at the stores but we like to keep it as low as possible in the stores and uh, keep most of our inventory at the central level we also follow a principle called you know we don't fill our stores based on gaps on shelves but we fill on you know based on what is consumed out of the stores so we fill the stores based on the consumption of the store we constantly try to improve our replenishment time to stores irrespective of the store size what we try to do is you know we try to increase the frequency of delivery to stores uh, so most of our stores would receive a delivery once in a day or once in two days to do all of this to be able to do all of this it's very important that we have a really really good uh, competent data management system and we have let's say data of every article in the system uh, as accurate as possible uh, because if you're keeping your inventory low at stores and you're you know hoping to replenish stores every day and not run, run out of stocks at the stores for the customers it is extremely important that you work on a really good data management system so you know we, we kind of pride ourselves on having built something that works for us i mean it does work for us currently and obviously lastly which again ties in to the third or the third point where we fill based on consumption but i still put this point here because we believe a lot in avoiding push based uh, replenishment system as much as possible uh, we try to stay away from you know forecasting too much uh, and uh, push anything which is not being commanded by consumption at the stores there are certain times where we have to push because there are certain days in the year where you know revenue you know, where sales goes up a little higher than normal so you know we use a little bit of forecasting in those instances but by and large we stay away from push based uh, replenishment at all times now what were the challenges that very specific challenges that uh, necessitated you know us uh, uh, looking out for uh, mr ravi's help uh, so you know in spite of us you know trying to do whatever i mentioned in our slide earlier just the previous slide we were not able to get our store level availability of our of our articles to above 80 percent and this was starting to get very frustrating for us we felt like we were doing everything that we could possibly can uh, but uh, there were very few instances where we saw that our availability for customers were at uh, above 80 percent what this did was obviously there was constant pressure on teams to increase stock holding centrally so we wouldn't run out of stocks so there was always a pressure on you know building more buffers at the central level obviously you know because the stores were seeing a little bit you know little higher outages of items there was constant pressure by the store teams to the central teams uh, and they always uh, you know bickered about how the stocks are inadequate for them to meet their sales targets also uh, with this again tied into uh, you know our anxiety and worries about the capacity of our central distribution centers to support our growth in store numbers going forward because uh, you know on the one hand we always felt the need to grow and increase our buffers centrally and uh, on the other hand we were also you know adding a lot of stores and we continue to add you know 20 25 stores a year so we were really starting to worry about you know how we would cope up with 
the growth in our revenue numbers uh, given the capacity of our central distribution centers. We also felt that you know we needed more alignment of all members of the top team you know on one set of common goals and uh, what to really focus on as a team and all of this obviously you know tied into or fed into the other problem of you know our sticky over to payables to our vendors and you know these were obviously you know we, we we kind of didn't realize that this was all a circular pattern which is you know number point number one was causing the last point to go you know to become sticky uh, so sticky over to peer, you know over to payables obviously fed into uh, the you know availability at the stores because vendors let's say would not look at us as a priority and uh, you know that would again lead to out of stocks at the stores and that again leads to the stores demanding more stocks and you know it's it's just a bad circle to be in so these were things uh, that necessitated that you know we we look for help from uh, Mr. Ravi. We then, you know, engaged with Mr. Ravi for a period of six months, as was mentioned uh, earlier, uh, and uh, actually a little over than six months. We started, uh, you know, with uh, Mr. Ravi giving us uh, 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 our entire top team uh, at least, I think, a month or four or five sessions first on you know the TOC fundamentals again uh, and aligning our team fully to the common goal and uh, you know through interactions with him every week uh, we learned some very valuable lessons along the way and uh, you know these basically are the learnings that uh, that I feel that we took out of this engagement and uh, I you know it, it's obviously in order the first one obviously is our you know unequivocal and single-minded focus you know of the entire team on throughput uh, you know we had to retweak how we calculated our throughput numbers a little bit uh, and uh, you know we had to get everyone in the team to really really start to think about uh, this one word throughput so you know everyone started talking about throughput all the time uh, we also learned another thing, very, very important thing that we've learned is that uh, suppliers actually not our, you know, enemies. Uh, they actually want to partner with us uh, a great deal. And, uh, you know, given that their nets are, in, that their needs are met and taken care of, uh, they can really help us, you know, do wonders. Uh, so this is another really big uh, learning that we've, that we've, you know, received in the last six to eight months because we've done this on the ground and we we've learned it uh, you know by doing actually not just by listening but actually doing so i think now you know everyone in our team at least is convinced that we need to do better for our suppliers and uh, that they will reciprocate uh, you know what we do good for them we also learned a very valuable lesson which is that we can actually reduce our inventory and also increase our stock availability at the same time we basically learned that these are you know, not very mutually exclusive uh, concepts at all. Uh, it is extremely possible to reduce inventory and at the same time increase stock availability. On the other side, we also learned another lesson, I guess, which is just, you know, the opposite of this, which is that uh, higher inventory does not mean uh, higher availability at all. So it could be the case that you have higher inventory but your availability actually is not as high. As we've grown in the last six months, we've managed to reduce our uh, inventory, uh, you know, sorry, inventory. I haven't put a number to this year, but uh, largely we managed to reduce our inventory by about 12 to 15%. Uh, and in the meantime, while we reduced our inventory, we increased availability of our products, you know, of our stores, you know, product filled to the customers from 82% to 93%. So as I mentioned in my earlier slide, our, you know, we were really frustrated that we were unable to grow this number from the 80s, the lower 80s. And uh, in a period of three to four months, we started seeing that this number went to 93% and as of today, I just checked, uh, you know, before I came in for this presentation also, 
I check my numbers yet again and just today also I'm very glad to report that this number today is at about 94 to 95 percent for all the articles listed in our stores for the high runners this number currently is showing 97 to 98 percent for us which is a huge huge change uh, you know to what we would see earlier we learned that you know we have to focus a little bit more on discarding let's say articles that are not performing based on the simple metric of t and t by i uh, these are very toc terms i guess uh, you know so a lot of the toc experts would probably understand this right away uh, but you know throughput and throughput by investment in our case investment would be mostly in inventory uh, and then last but not the least which we are working on still is that we as a team have started making better decisions purely by focusing on the metric of ti and OE, as taught by toc uh, so every decision we filter you know we try and filter through these you know three metrics and we try to make the decision as best as we can on these uh, metrics so these are very important learnings that we learned along the way uh, Shashwat, sorry for interrupting, but there's one question here regarding the T divided by I uh, uh, measurement. Mm -hmm. So um, what exactly are you considering as throughput and as investment um, in this case? Okay. So T for us is, uh, you know, literally, uh, you know, whenever we sell a product, it's about the selling price uh, uh, less the cost price of that product. So basically, you know, just whatever we bought it for and whatever we were sold at. And uh, and we add, a, you know, one other metric to it, which is our daily losses that we bear at the stores in terms of wastages and in terms of shrinkages. Shrinkages in retail would be, you know, something that you lost or something that, you know, is not matching up with your system stock. And wastages are basically items that have damaged or something. So we add that loss to our throughput every day. Uh, so largely that is our throughput. So whatever we sold and what what did we make on that uh, T? I for us in our case, I guess TOC calls it investment, uh, but in our case I is largely comprised of the inventory at the store or inventory that we carry in our books. Uh, sorry, Ravi sir, would you like to join, you know, jump in here? Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm not explaining this TOC term uh, well enough. See, no, 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 I'll explain. The purpose of any measurement is to make good decisions. Now, though conceptually, I stands for all money blocked in the system, and that includes capital investment also. But frankly, we don't start new stores every day. We don't build buildings. But what do we change every single day is the inventories. Fortunately for Big Mart, one thing is there, there's hardly any money to be received from the customers because customers pay almost instantaneously at the counter. So we do measure T by I for various products. In fact, we use this matrix of T by I. Sometimes this ratio is very good, sometimes it's very poor. For those articles where throughput is also small, and throughput by I is also unfavorable. We discarded quite a few parts. And on the other side, where throughput was good, T by I was also very good, this ratio. We tried to make sure that these products, we must increase the volume. And one of the first thing what we tried to do is that make sure these products do not have any stock out, number one. Now we need to increase the volumes of these items because they are both they generate high throughput and they're per unit of inventory they good they give good throughput also so even if we have to tweak some prices here and there we should do that now i would like to explain something here which shashwat can complement further for some products we had very good t by i eggs but the throughput was very small some of you may be surprised that the throughput for X as a percentage was just 3%. That means if you buy, uh, if we sell a 
एक फॉर वन डॉलर सेवन नाइनटी सेवन परसेंट वॉज आवर परचेज कॉस्ट बट द वॉल्यूम वॉज लार्ज एंड देर वॉज अ लॉट ऑफ थ्रू पुट एंड टी बाई आई वॉज ऑल्सो वेरी गुड वेरी लिटिल इन्वेंट्री तो वट डू वी डू हियर we try to increase the price of x by 1-2%. It did drop the sales a little bit, but overall, if I remember correctly, our throughput went up about 60-70-80%. So, what we use... Yes, and, and, and it, yes. You can explain that better. Yeah. No, no, sorry. I, I was just complimenting you saying that it's it's held to date. So, that, okay. that growth has held. Okay, so what we are looking is at any measurement you make, any measurement, if it doesn't lead to better decision making or action, it's a waste. Why are you measuring at all? So all through what we try to have few measurements so that they help us take better decisions. That's all. Okay, thank you. I think the, yeah, seems like the question is answered. So Shashwat, okay. can, can continue. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, this probably is my last slide, I guess. Yes, it is. So yeah, we talked about better decision-making by focusing on TI and OE. Again, Ravi sir just uh, elaborated on that. And, uh, you know, just a few of these results that I just put it out there. Uh, you know, we managed to increase our throughput uh, by about 33% overall. In the corresponding period, obviously our sales increased by 28%, but what you notice is the sales increased by a lesser amount uh, compared with the throughput. And compared to last year in the same period, our profits increased by about 200%, the same period last year. So these were really, really good uh, you know, results that we saw. Uh, and not to mention our vendor overdue payables and our you know, almost down to zero. And uh, we have more cash with, you know, which to expand our store network. And, uh, you know, I am very happy to say that uh, we've, you know, increased uh, the rate at which our stores are expanding now. Uh, and because, uh, because we've learned that, uh, you know, you don't necessarily need to increase buffers centrally to increase your availability at the stores, uh, if you can just work better with your vendors, uh, you know what? I mean, it's given us the confidence now that uh, you know with the same central capacity now, we feel that we can, you know, serve at least another 40, 40 50 stores. Uh, so, you know, we want to be expanding as fast as we can to exhaust that central capacity. But you know, as we get more and more mature with TOC principles i think uh, that when we get to that you know 120 store mark we'll realize that we need even lesser central capacity and that we need even lesser buffers at the at the central capacity so and it's all very exciting for us uh, we're really really looking forward to what else is our way in the next uh, one or two years as we get uh, you know as we get more and more deeper into the toc you know fundamentals principles and we make decisions every day based on t t by i and uh, you know oe and uh, we really look uh, with excitement towards the future uh, you know so hopefully i've made our case in this uh, in this uh, very brief presentation uh, thank you everyone for you know patiently listening to me uh, Please shoot any questions that you have. I'm more than happy to be of uh, help and assistance to you all. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rashwat. This was very uh, impressive, um, uh, your, your results and your presentation. And also, if you look at uh, <clears throat> how, how long you have actually uh, been with uh, working with this TOC. So um, I have a couple of questions here that, that have come in over the last uh, minutes. So let's go to the first one here. Um, good to hear you, Shashwat. I can relate closely. It's a commendable effort to being consumption-driven distribution system. <clears throat> um, a few questions. 
Number one, how is the new store stock or inventory planned at uh, your end? That would be the first question here from that person, from Anush Tivari, if I pronounce that correctly. It is, it is a bit of a complicated thing if you complicate it too much is what we think. You said, how is the new store inventory planned, right? Yes. Maybe you can uh, elaborate on that question. Though I wasn't there when he was starting the new store, but whatever I could make it out. First of all, there's no perfect answer. But looking at the store characteristic on the new one, what they looked at it, they had 75 other stores. Wherever the, there was very close correlation, they could put it. But I'll tell you straight away, because their replenishment time, they do almost daily replenishment, sometimes uh, uh, alternate day. So the store stock ideally should not be more than two or three days or four days of required. So that's the way. In fact, the more challenge would be what stocks to keep in different stores, because not everything will be identical. Shashwat has joined, I think. So we can ask him to uh, elaborate more on this. Yes, very. We keep it very simple. You know, we look at categories, and uh, for every category, you know, we kind of look at what other store could be similar to that category for that store, and we basically just kind of go with that for a period of two months with that store for that category. And uh, unless this this new store itself then starts to generate its own sales data, uh, we go and uh, it just works fine for us. I mean. We haven't seen a deal of problems there. Okay, thank you. Um, then the second question here, have you foreseen the possibility of multiple central warehousing at your end? And what what could be the challenges yes, we around have. that? Yes, okay. yes we have. Yes. Yeah, no, actually we do operate out of multiple uh, you know, central distribution, central facilities currently also. We do operate out of, out of multiple central facilities. Uh, I mean, frankly speaking, we don't see a great challenge there also. I mean, you know, as long as, you know, our data management systems are correct, uh, we should be fine. Mm -hmm. So the central, um, it's like a regional distribution center then, or is, does uh, every central store hold a different uh, different variety? Yes, as of now, you know, they deal with different uh, kinds of products. Uh, but there are certain categories that are held in multiple, multiple distribution centers also. Okay. But very few, but very few. So another question, how are you measuring the market potential and how you feel you are placed there and what is GlidePath? I'm not sure I fully understand that question. <laughs> Yes, it's a very difficult question to answer for us. Uh, you know, Nepal, you know, being Nepal, very hard to get overall market potential data in in Nepal. But, uh, you know, based on whatever we know, uh, we know that, you know, we're just about scratching the surface for now. You know, we kind of uh, address maybe about 5% of the entire addressable market that we are in. Uh, so we see a lot of headroom for our growth uh, into the future. Okay, thank you. If I may add question? small yeah. thing, Christoph, sure. you see, as Shashwat said, maybe you are addressing 3%, 5%, 10%, who knows? But we have a philosophy what we call better than before. What we are looking is that every week we measure last four weeks uh, average. And these four weeks average should keep on going up. And that's what we have been trying for the last six, seven months. And I believe it has helped us quite a bit. So wh what do we care whether the scope is 1,000 times more or 10,000 times more? We just need to go up. That's all. Mm -hmm. it's a very practical approach. Yeah. Um, another question here from Guillermo. Do you consider work ca working, working capital requirements in your decision process? I mean, taking besides inventory into account supplier payables and customer receivables. 
I guess you answered the, the yeah, customer yeah, receivable, receivable part already because there are none. There are none. There are none. And, uh, you know, working capital for us is uh, net positive at all times. So as we increase our revenue, uh, our working capital actually, you know, increases in the positive direction for us so as of now working capital requirements uh, at least in our business i don't think it's a problem it's it's more of a surplus actually um then nerius is asking if you are using any specific software for uh, dynamic buffer management it's a very technical question already i uh, know yeah 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 i i, I know that you know it you know, if you can complicate it as much as you can, but, uh, you know, we are very big believers that, you know, end of the day, dynamic buffer management is all about, you know, increasing or decreasing buffers based on certain inputs, right? So on a weekly level, that's what we do at least at our end. And uh, we have a great software to manage that. It's called Excel. I, I, I don't Sorry. know if it answered the question, but, you know, at least- Yeah, I think it I, answered the question, right? So it's- <laughs> But I'd like to ask, Ashwat, how many different SKUs you manage? Can you give an idea? As of now, we manage about 4,500 SKUs. And okay. we adjust our buffers every week. Yeah, and, yet, and we adjust our buffers every week. Uh, so we don't do it on a daily basis. We do it on a weekly basis based on certain criteria that we have set for ourselves. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm very happy, you know, or you know, this question came up today because uh, I was in a two hour meeting today just before this presentation <laughs> discussing our buffers and how we can do the, you know, you know, how we can do the dynamic buffer management even better. Um, then we have a question from Sanjeev Kapoor. How many organizational constraints have you been able to identify and move to next? What is the velocity to move ahead of overcoming constraints? That sounds like a very TOC loaded question to me, so I'd like to pass it on to <laughs> Ravi sir. For all retail people, there's only practically one constraint, cash. But we didn't have that. We had a constraint of orders, and we are continuing with that. We did not have a constraint of cash before, we don't have the cash constraint today. We have a constraint of orders. More people can come in, we serve more. And we want to keep them at that level. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, the next question is from Aditya Pandit. Good work, Shashwat and Ravi, sir. How are you going to sustain this growth per store? as footfall to an individual store may not increase exponentially. You're right. I mean, you know, in the long term, we're all dead, right? So, so <laughs> we'll, we'll go as it, you know, as it gets there. But uh, I mean, I mean, jokes apart, uh, you know, we see that our mature stores are still growing at about uh, 10 to 12% annually in terms of their top lines but more than their top lines what is more encouraging to see is that throughput is growing at about 17 to 18 percent annually so these are for mature stores that i'm talking about uh, we also think that uh, since we're in a very very uh, let's say you know immature market uh, we think uh, that there's a lot of headroom for growth you know even at the store level uh, and in the past, what we've also seen is that as we grow our store network and uh, we grow the brand, we see that even existing stores get more footfalls because people start to identify with us more. And we believe that if we become the top choice for customers to buy groceries every day, we think that we can continue to grow, you know, even our mature stores into the future into the near future is what i'd say and long term again you know who's seen anything so long term i guess we're all dead so we're not planning 
uh, all the way you know 10 years or 15 years into the future anyways for us currently you know with with ravi sir's blessings uh, we mostly think about the next week <laughs> and we try to become better than what we've been in the past 13 moving weeks uh, as long as we continue to do that i think we'll be all right mm -hmm. ravi sir did i did i answer that correctly i yes. i don't know if you want oh, to take that there is some thinking we can do because regularly we'll have to see which SKUs to add or to delete. That should also be a continuous process because as we keep on adding higher margin SKUs and not so good SKUs, that will also add to the throughput on a regular basis, even at the same store level. Yes, yes. As of now, we are seeing good uh, throughput growth in the mature stores also. Thank you. Um, then the next question is uh, from Deepak Sethi. Sasha, what, what did you mean by saying working better with suppliers has helped significantly? Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, I mean, that I think is a session in itself uh, <laughs> in, in the first place <laughs> with whatever, you know, we've thought through and whatever we've been able to do. Uh, working better with suppliers i guess it's more of a mentality change of the team where you know you first have to really understand that the suppliers are there to help you uh, so you know i i'll give you very specific examples that we worked on so that maybe it'll kind of register a little bit uh, there were instances uh, you know where when we started asking our suppliers to supply to our you know distribution centers frequently, which is at least once in two days, uh, the first uh, complaint or, you know, the first blocker we saw was that the suppliers uh, were worried that their trucks would not come loaded to our distribution centers. And so they would lose money supplying to us uh, frequently. Now, you know, in an, in a, you know, in a situation like that, usually what we do earlier, I don't know about the other retailers, but what we do earlier is, we, you know, we, we just try to bully them around. We say that's what we want you know you do it by hook or crook i don't give a damn you know so you you have to come in uh but what we learned from ravi sir specifically is that uh, you know if they if they say that they cannot come with a full load to our dc distribution center we started telling them see whatever capacity of your car is not utilized uh please take cash from us right there at the dc and we empowered our DC people to make the decision right there and then uh, to pay the supplier for the for the free, you know, for the excess capacity in the vehicle right away. Again, this is something that Ravi sir, you know, really enforced on us. And, uh, you know, in the initial stages, uh, our team, you know, as with any team, they started first saying that, sir, we'll be spending a lot of money on this and, you know, it's, it's going to be very expensive and this and that and all that. And, you know, again, with Ravi sir's help, he said, you know, just try and do it, <laughs> you know. Uh, and uh, what we saw was when our team started talking to vendors in that note, saying that, see, we're here to help you. We just need your help. And if it means that, you know, you're taking a loss doing it, please take the cash right away. The vendors quickly realized that we are there to help them. You know, we're there to work with them. And uh, I'm so happy to report that in 15 or you know we tracked the expenses for a for a one month period and uh, my team themselves were surprised that we didn't spend at all i mean there was cash lying in the dc to pay the suppliers but no supplier actually wanted to take the money from us and eventually what the supplier said was see this is our work and how can i take money from you for coming and delivering to your dc so i'm, I'm literally just highlighting this incident this one incident here just to kind of prove the point that it's just about an attitude change just the shift in an attitude towards your vendors towards your your partners and it changes a lot so this is just one of many things that we did and i could go talking about it for a long time as i said it would be another session altogether but this is one very big example maybe i've made it clear for more i think ravi sir would be a better resource on this because he's done this more than i have you know so <laughs> and just add one small thing you see, we started measuring what is our overdue to suppliers. 
and this was one of the first thing is let's bring it down to zero so as the suppliers also started getting their payments on time without any delay whatsoever they realized that there is something possible which can be done so they also reciprocated in fact one of the most important thing is for large companies specifically is to make sure that their vendors are paid absolutely on time absolutely not one day late okay thank you and um i, th I think we really we will remind you of that uh, offer to talk about uh, supplier relationship uh, and maybe you can come to our next uh, innovation summit in 2024 to uh, give a presentation there um then the next That'd question another one That'd yes wonderful i think in another year's time yeah i think in another year's time we will have changed the landscape by a huge margin here i'm very positive oh, yes. of that yeah and if you uh, continue that you know, uh, continuous improvement like you have described um, i have no doubt that you will be growing tremendously yes uh, so then the next another question here from from uh, Deepak as well what uh, measures or initiatives if any are you taking in order to increase the footfalls to your stores ah uh, again that is another big question <laughs> <that> <laughs> so you will again... have two presentations next year yeah which is the session by itself uh yeah, I'd, 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 I'll just say something very, very simple here, which is that, uh, you know, we're in the groceries business and uh, I at least don't believe that you can increase footfalls in a groceries business, let's say, in a matter of, you know, days. Uh, it really is a business where you have to excel every day. And uh, if you excel on all the basic stuff that you need to do for your customer on a daily basis, uh, you know, you see that footfalls to the store grows over a period of time. So it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm sure it's the same with all other businesses. I'm, I'm, you know, I know of it, but I, I really think that this is one business which, uh, which tests you every day. And because you are so related to people, you know, with their daily needs. It's all about, you know, uh, working on the basics every day uh, so that your footfalls grow over a period of time, which is more sustainable, which is also the right way to do it, which is, I think, also the correct way. And in this business, also another thing is nothing works better than word of mouth, right, in, in the customer mind. So, you know, that only builds up over a period of time. So I don't know if I've answered the question correctly. You know, we really don't do a lot of a uh, lot of above the line marketing because we don't believe that you know footfalls can grow in in two days or three days. But we really focus on working on the fundamentals uh, to help the customer better, and which uh, grows our customer base every day. Uh, that's what I would say to that question. But again, I mean. There are so many things that can be discussed on that. That's a session altogether by itself. So, Ravi sir, if there's anything that you don't, you know, add on to that, you've visited our stores. I don't know if you've seen us, you know, you've seen us do things. And uh... no, you have been doing great. The most important thing when I first time when I asked you how long it takes during the checkout, and it's hardly any time. Though on the face of it, I accepted it, but I wasn't too sure. But I, when I visited your stores in Kathmandu, I could not. I visited a couple of your, your stores, and nowhere I found any queues at all, none. At best, one or two people. That's all. And to my mind, that's a very, very crucial aspect. The service at the last uh, point often is not okay in most uh, retail stores in the world over, and that includes India also. We find huge queues at the checkout time that's a irritant if not a pain so i hope you will keep like that so that's the way i'll, I'll wish you to do that oh yes, yes it's a metric that we track a lot i mean we don't like a store getting too crowdy if if we see that a store is getting more footfalls than it should get we go and open another store right next to it 
uh, because as you said customer experience is the key and a big part of the customer experience in our stores is uh, is the checkouts so i hope i have answered that question you know to deepak i, I think. think so yeah yeah Then um, we have a question around obsolescence. Do you have uh, obsolescence? Um, and then typical retail business has very few SKUs. Do you also work on reverse logistics? Yes, from that's from Anush Tiwari. Yeah, it's it's a good question. I mean, uh, obviously we don't face obsolescence because uh, we're in the groceries business and we hold inventory at stores of about 20 days at the moment and uh, you know seven to eight days at the central distribution center so we don't uh, face a significant in fact not even you know a minuscule problem with our obsolescence uh, and uh, i think the second part of the question was if you could repeat that oh do, do we also do some reverse logistics yes. oh yes yes exactly yeah yes 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 so you know we do reverse logistics and uh, especially uh, as I mentioned in my presentation also that whenever we do a push uh, replenishment to stores for occasional sales, that's when we see the biggest need for reverse uh, logistics. Uh, especially in categories like, you know, if I were to be specific, uh, categories like uh, liquor, uh, you know, these don't sell every day. So, you know, you keep a very thin stock at the stores for most of the days of the year but then you know these this category sells very very high on certain days of the week or certain days of the month uh, so you know we kind of push a little bit during those times to the stores and because these are very expensive uh, you know articles it tends to raise stockholder at the store and you know it kind of gets your inventory turns out of uh, toss so we kind of do a reverse logistics to get it back to our central facility. So we do work a fair bit on our reverse logistics to, you know, kind of bring our stocks back to our DC. Uh, but we don't do it, let's say not a lot of it. I mean, certainly not as much as Ravi sir here would like us to do, uh, but, uh, but we do indulge in that a little bit. Ravi sir, if there's something that you would, you know, I, I see that you are smiling at that, so. Yeah, because uh, you can still, in my opinion, your inventory is still too high. It should be brought down, if not to one third, at least to half than where you are today. So anyway, uh, you, you will do it yourself uh, a little slowly osmosis rather than a big push that can create a problem. You experience and you will do, keep on doing it yourself. I'm quite uh, hopeful of that. In fact, yeah, sure, you of can, that, can no? be sure of that. Yes, you can be. Okay, thank you. Um, what would be the frequency of changing buffer levels? I think you, yeah. Yeah, at the DC level, at the central level, it is uh, weekly. And at the store level, we try to do it once in three months. We don't try to change buffers at the stores too frequently. Uh, so, you know, DC levels is every week. Okay. Um, then we have another one from Nir Niranjan as well. Is there any mechani mechanism to identify the constraints at suppliers end? Mm. <laughs> 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 very, very hard question. Uh, and and we do try to do this you know nowadays we are you know as we you know as we get deeper and deeper into this partnering with our suppliers concept and we see better and better results coming out of it uh, we are starting to realize that at some point we will need to start to look at what are the constraints on the suppliers end also uh, and as I mentioned, you know, most of our suppliers are importers uh, into the country. You know, they have varying capacity, uh, you know, varying degrees of capacity at their end. 
so we are starting to realize that we'll really need to take deeper look into their constraints and uh, and see how we can help them overcome those constraints so i think at some point we will end up becoming you know some kind of toc consultants to our supplier community you know and hopefully you know we'll do a good job of it otherwise you know there are people like yourselves here to help us with this <laughs> at that <laughs> Um, then we go back to the stores, to your store footprint. What is the decision criteria for opening new stores? Um, you know, because we are doing small stores uh, with uh, very, very efficient cost structures, we really don't need to think a lot about, uh, you know, the let's say the catchment area of the store or something. So what we are just looking to do is, even if we have about 300 households in the area, we think that we can make a store work uh, just by keeping our uh, economics, you know, cost economics very low. Uh, and uh, definitely, you know, we look for places where there is a dense catchment of people, you know, residential catchment. And uh, we also look at stores that you know are on the roads where people go back home from their offices a lot we believe that uh, you know people do a lot of their grocery shopping on their way back to homes in the evening so we like you know to identify these roads that are most traveled you know back home and we try to locate our stores you know somewhere close there uh, so you know there are a few few considerations that we have but you know generally this is you know what we do we also go by a lot of feel you know a lot of people who understand the city or the place very well we take their imports you know inputs also so okay not very complicated again yeah thank you then we have two questions uh, regarding promotions the first one is very general so what is the best advice that you would like to share in order to manage promotions and the second one is if you run special discounted prices on some, some items in order to entice customers to visit the store. Yes. Both of these are concepts that, you know, as we've become more mature as retailers, we've come to understand are not of much use. Uh, again, so, you know, people put a lot of emphasis on these promotions business. Uh, through the years, what we've realized is uh, a lot of it is wasted. Uh, so, you know, customers actually are really, you know, looking for things that are much more than just promotions. And, uh, you know, we focus working on those issues more than working on our promotions. But having said that, as a grocery store, we obviously like to, you know, put out promotions to our customers just to you know, kind of surprise them at times just to kind of make them feel good about. Uh, one thing that we've really learned through the years is that, uh, you know, we really have to look at promotions through the eyes of T and I, you know, throughput and investment into the promotions. And, uh, you know, we've come to realize over a period of time that there are only very few products that, uh, that are worth investing on, uh, at least in our business. So. You know, we we do promotions very selectively. Uh, one, and uh, you know, we really don't believe that promotions are the most important thing to entice customers to the store. The second business of you know, few products enticing people to a store. We've come to kind of challenge that as well nowadays, and uh, you know, we. You know, as we get more mature, I think we are getting more evidence that uh, those are also things that are that probably are just said uh, and uh, not very relevant to the need of the customers. Also, having said that, again, we do you know look at ten or fifteen products in our entire portfolio, which we kind of uh, you know benchmark greatly with the market and. We think that it entices customers to our stores, but again, you know, if you ask me for really good evidence, we'd be, I'd be hard pressed to find that. 
So that's about what we do for promotions or what our belief systems are. Okay. Thank you. And um, ah, do you experience demand seasonality? If yes, how do you deal with it? Yes, we do ex you know, experience demand seasonality, uh, but not to a great extent you know, as it would be, let's say, for an apparel retailer or someone. Uh, you know, end of the day, it's grocery. So you know, even if things grow, it will grow by 100%, 150% over the season. And uh, most of the times what we've seen is historical data is a very good indicator of, uh, of seasonality uh, you know, demand spikes. So we look at our historical data and based on that, we, you know, kind of forecast uh, sales a little bit and we do a little bit of push replenishment uh, to manage these. But once we kind of uh, start on a season, we kind of then look at it very dynamically every week and uh, adjust to the seasonal demands as it goes on every week. So that's how we manage it with, you know, as with everything, I think with TOC, we manage it with frequency of planning a little bit. So, you know, we try to keep the forecast uh, uh, period as low as possible and, uh, you know, adjust uh, things very dynamically every week for seasonal articles. So that's that's what we believe in. Ravi sir, is there anything that you'd like to add there? No, it's perfect. What you said is perfect. Okay. Ah, oh, another question coming here. If throughput, if throughout, sorry, if throughout the only reason to increase, ah, uh, no, uh, is throughput, that's, I think that's what it should read here, is throughput the only reason to increase prices of eggs? Have you tried with other products uh, as well? I think this goes back to the egg example when, when we talked about throughput divided by investment. Yeah, I mean, with, with the eggs example, the, the decision was purely about throughput, for sure. I mean, we wanted to increase throughput in that article because we saw that uh, it was very low margin throughputs. Uh, and uh, the other one there would be, you know, sometimes, again, this is a discussion that I've had with uh, Mr. Ravi also on this, which is that sometimes when you only look at the throughput side of things, you tend to miss, let's say, the OE part of things, right? So the expenses. Uh, that are associated with it. So in the case of eggs, for example, when we were generating about 3% throughput, uh, we were probably spending about 2% on distribution uh, of the product. And distribution is not part of throughput, you know, so we were not really making money on the product. So we said, you know, if distribution is going to be 2% of, you know, for of throughput, you know, for the product, we might as well increase the throughput for the product. Otherwise, uh, you know, we're not making money end of the day. So for certain categories and some products, you really have to look at T and OE same time. Uh, but yeah, for most of the products, it's just good enough to look at the T on a weekly level. So that is what our decisioning criteria or factor was. Uh, Ravi sir, is that something that uh, you would agree no, with? You're, or, uh, you're saying it quite correctly that sometime, most of the time, OE may not have much of an impact, but in case it changes, then we have to take care. There's no dispute about it. Yes, there's another thing. In certain products, the T by I is very poor. Now, one method of improving that is increase T by increasing prices or increasing sales with the same inventory. And another way is let's look at it and reduce the inventory there. Then also T by I becomes better. Okay, thank you. And then, have what is your current replenishment frequency to your stores? Question by Albert Visser. Uh, top twenty-five percent of our stores are replenished on a daily basis, and uh, the rest of the stores are replenished. Uh, 
every next day. Okay. And he continues with another question. Does your local store have a bulk store space? Sorry, a dark store space? A bulk. Oh, bulk not at all. Uh, we we no, are no, 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 no. We are big believers in not having a back store at all. Okay. So you know, for us, for all the stores, the only back store is the central distribution center, and nothing else. Looks like we have made it through all the questions for the moment. So is there anything you would like to add, uh, Ravi? Yes. Uh, as uh, Shashwat has explained, the results have been quite encouraging in about six months period. And whatever I could make it out, these are not temporary. They will continue to go further for quite some time, uh, at least a few years, if not few months. But not only that, I remember these results are there after six months, but we also looked at it after three months. Even then, they were not as good as this, but they were st still significantly better than before. In fact, uh, I'm going to have a session at the conference on very practical steps, how to get results fast and what I call sustainable. There's no point getting results fast and then falling flat. There are, I mean, it's aligning both the short term and the long term. I must share one small thing which I learned almost 22 years back. There's no conflict between short term and long term if if we take those short term steps which pave the way for long term steps. So they align beautifully together. So I'm going to share. So if any one of you who are in the attendance, they're yet not registered for the conference. I do recommend that they will benefit if they could register for the conference because mine will be just one of the very few presentations, but there are many, many other excellent presentations going to be there. So suggestion to all the people who are listening to this. And I can only reinforce that message. So we, we really have a great program this year with a lot of uh, case studies, uh, practical examples out of uh, the real world. So it's it's going to be really special. So if you are in, in Florida in, in mid of um, October, or if you can get there, um, it's, it's something you should really should not miss. So it looks like we have uh, gone through all the questions from from the audience, which means unless there is something, somebody else who is coming in with a question here in the last minute. Ah, there's one, <laughs> of course. Shelf space is fixed while product size vary. That's not really a question. Albert. What exactly is a question? Um, if I can just speak, uh, yes, it's, faster than, yeah. it's faster than typing. So, so we, we have daily replenishment, the shop shelf space are fixed and we have variability in demand and we have variability in the size of the products. So you might have the huge demand on one product that's very small and, um, you know, trying to replenish it, you might have other stuff that's bigger and trying to figure out how if there's no buffer on the shelf space or a back store that you can just absorb. So my assumption is what he said is that immediately when they get delivery, the delivery would be taken into the store and immediately go onto the shelf because there's no there's no space to put it other than on the shelves. And and so as demand varies between different products, you know, the shelf space that they take up might take up very you know, different products and 
timing is not perfect, obviously. So, you know, the question is really just figuring out how do you deal with that variation in demand and supply in terms of a fixed entity that's a, a shelf space that, that's the physical limitation of the shop. I, I, I get where the question, you know, comes from. Uh, you know, you have to remember, again, I gave you a context uh, at the beginning of the program is that, uh, you know, we don't operate in a very mature market uh, where, you know, you have planograms fixed at the shelf level, you know, things of those sort. Uh, so we have our planograms, you know, at the shelf level, you know, at the box level only one. So, you know, products can expand or contract based on the quantities. And secondly, you know, I also mentioned that uh, we do not change the buffers at the stores very frequently. So that's only done about once in three months, uh, which means that, you know, the quantities to the stores are fixed every day. I mean, every day at least, you know, the stores know that this is the max amount of this product that will come to their store. Uh, so we cap it at that. And uh, as you said, you know, some article might, you know, run out faster, some might run out slower. We try to take care of that with daily replenishment to the store. So, you know, our DC supplies in pieces, not in boxes. So, you know, a store would get a delivery of an article for just one piece also every day, uh, just to maintain that whatever decided buffer is at the store. So generally it works out for us since we're not in a very mature market in that sense. Uh, but I do understand your concern in more mature markets where you have your shelves, you know, planogrammed and stuff. You would definitely need a little bit of buffer in your stores to manage those spikes. Does that answer the question properly? Uh, yes, thank you. Just a question, you know, if you have said you got a buffer of 100, uh, obviously, depending on the delivery time, you know, you, you might be, the actual stock might be at 50. Um, yes. So, so, uh, and and if you receive 60, then obviously you've got 10 more than is available on the shelf space. If you've got 10 less, then obviously there's there's enough shelf space to to deal with the receipt. Um, so, you know, just in terms of the starting conditions for the store or whatever they might have, you in planning for the the quantity of the buffer that you should be keeping. Um, it's sort of a question in terms of around that uh, because, as I said, the buffer is if it's 100. Um, depending whether you receive it at the end of each day, then obviously, hopefully, you sold the 100 on the previous day, or if it was 150, you sold 100 of that and you receive another 100. Um, so it's just a question of, of evaluating the actual buffers versus the actual stock, average stock available on the shelf, and, and how you sort of set the starting conditions for that yes yes exactly exactly so what, what you said is correct so you know if the buffer has been decided at 100 and the stock is at 50 at no point will the store get 60. you know you have a cutoff time you know to look at the inventory of the store and if it's 50 you know it will never be a case where the store gets uh let's say a more than 100 stock at the store so 100 is the max that the store will get at any point of time. That will be the stock at the store at any point of time. Uh, and it will always be lesser than 100. Since we are also delivering in one pieces, you know, we break bulk, it ensures that our stores don't have to worry about, you know, more than 100 coming to their stores. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, thank you for everybody who uh, listened to uh, or watch this uh, webinar today for for being with us for for following this really great uh, development that we see here with with Big Mart. It's I think it's it's very encouraging and and also um, it really gives gives oneself the 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 willingness to do the same in in, uh, in different environments. So thank you for for sharing that, um, Sharvat and and Ravi. And thank you for all the attendees uh, for being with us here. Um, yeah, as we have been through all the questions, I think we can give each other a little bit of time for all the other things that uh, that we still have to do. 
So um, if it's your evening, then I wish you a very good night. Um, if it's your morning, I wish you a very successful day. And if the day is half over, then make the best of uh, the time that is left. Ravi Shashwat, uh, thanks again for being with us today and sharing your journey. Thank you, thanks for the opportunity. It's an honor. Thank you. Bye-bye.